that one of the functions of the sky or the atmosphere is that it returns. What does it return? We know water. Water, it comes down to the earth, and then it evaporates, condenses, and it comes back down. So we have evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Water evaporates, condenses, and then returns back down to the earth. This was the way many of the early spotters understood. But recently, they have discovered something more. They have discovered that the atmosphere actually has many layers, and each layer has a function of returning something back down to the earth or back into space. By the sky, that return. So we have the troposphere, which has this function, that water evaporates, and then it returns it back down to the earth. Then you have another layer of the atmosphere that is called the ozonosphere. And the function of this layer of the atmosphere is that it returns the harmful rays emitted from the sun back into space. So it acts like a shield, okay? It only allows a certain amount, most of it is harmful. So it acts like a shield and returns it back into space. Then you have another layer of the atmosphere called the ionosphere. And the function of this layer of the atmosphere is that many of the waves that are emitted from the earth, okay, like radio waves and television waves, all of them, when they go, this layer of the atmosphere, it returns it back into the earth. And this is what makes wireless communication possible over long distances. And these are things we're just coming to discover in the last century. By the sky, that by the atmosphere, that is returning. It has the function of returning something. Another miracle is mentioned in Surah Qiyamah, the chapter of uh, Qiyamah. That is the name. La al Qiyamah wa la I'll translate the verse and basically give you the background story behind it. When was this surah revealed, or why was these verses revealed? It was revealed to refute the claim of those people who said there is no such thing as life after death. There is no such thing as a day of resurrection. They used to say, how is it possible for us to be resurrected after we have died, when our bodies have decomposed, our bones have decayed? How can we come back into the same form? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, He says, does man think we will not be able to bring back together his bones? Nay, we're able to bring back together even the very tips of his fingers. Now notice, why is it that of all of the body parts, only the fingertips are mentioned? Okay, why not maybe something more important, maybe the eyes or the brain or the heart? Why not mention something that is more vital instead of mentioning the tips of the fingers? Look at what the verse is saying. Does man think we will not be able to bring back together his bones? No, rather we are capable of even bringing back together the very tips of his fingers. You know why this has been mentioned? Recently they have just discovered that every person has a unique fingerprint. Okay? They have never found, within the billions of people out there, two people with identical fingerprints. Since the creation of Adam till now, they have not found two people with identical fingerprints. Even identical twins who have a similar DNA, even they have a different fingerprint. It is said our identity is coded at the tips of our fingers. And it is kind of similar to the barcode system we have in the back of books. And so every person has a unique fingerprint. Even criminologists nowadays, if a crime happens and they have to investigate, what do they look for? The first thing they look for is fingerprint. Because this is unique to each and every single person. This people did not know before. They have just recently discovered in the last century. And so this is what the Quran says. Does man think we will not be able to bring back together his bones? Rather, we are capable of even bringing back together even the very tips of his fingers. Another miracle mentioned in the Quran is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, talks about many of his blessings and he talks about the rain in the clouds. And the description he gives to the clouds is that he is the one who heaps up the heavy clouds. So this is the description given to the clouds. That it is extremely heavy. Not just heavy, extremely heavy. Who could have thought back then that clouds were heavy? Even nowadays, if we did not know much about science, if someone was to ask you, you would think, okay, clouds are maybe a little bit dense, but who could have thought that they're heavy? Now they have just discovered that there are some clouds, you know, the thunder cloud or the rain cloud, and the more scientific name for it is the cumulonimbus cloud, that it can hold up to 300,000 tons of water. Okay, one ton is 2,000 pounds. Not three tons, not 30 tons, not 3,000 tons. 
300,000 tons of water in it. And this is what the Quran describes as the cloud. It is he who heaps up the heavy clouds. Another example, and this is one of my favorite examples, is in Surah An-Nahl. And in this chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again talks about many of his blessings, about the fruits and vegetations and all of the things that he has created for mankind. One of the things he mentioned is about the honeybee. Okay? You know, honey has a lot of medical benefits and it's also a blessing from God. So in order to understand this, again, you have to bear with me for a few seconds because I have to explain it and also explain to you a, a rule of grammar to really appreciate this miracle of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking of the honeybee. Okay? And he's speaking to the honeybee in the first person. And your Lord has inspired unto the honeybee. And to build houses in the mountains and in the trees, and also in the buildings the people erect. Then Allah commands the honeybee. Then eat of every different type of food. And then follow the ways of your Lord that has been made easy for you. So by the way, from this we see that it is Allah who inspires the honeybee. Okay, and it's because of this inspiration that they're able to do so much. Otherwise, no one teaches the honeybee to go and find you know, a flower and then come back. They have a natural GPS system in their brain. Right? When they go and they find a flower, when they come back, they're able to tell the rest of the honeybees exactly where the flower was, the exact direction, and how far it was. And they have an exact measurement. They do like a, the honey beehive, they do a certain dance, and that is supposed to be equal to a certain amount, maybe 1.7 miles. So if they do that three times, that's supposed to equal something. And all of that, they program and they know this. And they'll go to that exact location, to the exact spot, find the flower and collect nectar from it. So anyway, this is something God has inspired the honeybee. Now what is the miracle of this? Again, there's three, four different aspects of, you know, that is miraculous about this. But I just point towards one. When God is speaking to the honeybee, he's using the feminine form, okay? Now this is a little bit difficult to understand because in English grammar, we don't have this concept. That you have words that can come in masculine form and you can have words coming in feminine form. Okay? We only have this for pronouns. For example, if I'm speaking of a third person, if it's a male, I'll say he. If it's a female, I'll say she. But if it's a first, and if I'm speaking of the second person, you, it's the same whether it's a male or a female. You and you. It doesn't change. But in Arabic, all of the pronouns, as well as many of the verbs and nouns, they come in both forms. In, uh, in, in the masculine form and also in the feminine form. So, for example, if I want to say in Arabic to someone, e, it would be kul. But if it's a female, it would be kuli. If I say you, in Arabic it's anta. But if it's a female, anti. So you add an e sound at the end. Now, what is interesting here is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, when He speaks to the honeybee, He uses the feminine form. As if He's speaking to a female honeybee. And this is very interesting, because generally speaking in the Qur'an, Allah uses only the masculine form, which is generic and includes everyone. But specifically here, when God is speaking, and speaking directly to the honeybee, He uses the feminine form. Why is that? That He's speaking only to the female uh, honeybee. Why? Because they have just recently discovered that it's actually the female honeybee that does all of the work in the beehive. The male worker bees, they're actually very lazy and they don't do anything. All they do is just sit with the queen and that's it. Nothing more than that. It is the female honeybees that go and look for flowers, collect nectar, then uh, fix the beehive, ventilate the beehive, they protect it against external enemies, so on and so forth. All of this is done by the female honeybee. The male honeybee doesn't do anything. And this was just recently discovered. And this is the only place in the Quran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to the uh, beehive, the bee, he's speaking the feminine form. There's also, for example, in Surah to Naba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about the mountains, he says, Wal okay? And the mountains, we have made them as pegs, like nails. So he mentions the function of the mountain. That is similar to the function of nails. So what is the function of a nail? That it holds the material together. If you embed it in something, it holds the uh, material together. So for example, a little bit of it will be on top of the surface. Most of it will be inside of the material. Recently they have just discovered this is the exact function of the mountain. Previously they did not know. They thought mountains were just raised portions of the earth, just protrusions of the earth. But recently they have discovered if the mountain is of a certain height above uh, the ground, it is 15 times deeper inside the ground. And it acts just like a nail holding all of the place of the earth together. 
So what is Jibal Awtara? And the mountains we have made them as faith. And just one quick two, three more um, other miracles about the predictions made in the Quran. There's a whole list. There's over like 34 miracles, scientific miracles, but I just gave a few examples. There's also a whole list, and very quickly, I'll just mention one or two, because this is also very, very interesting. One of the miracles of the uh, Quran is that God has promised that because it is the final revelation, the final inspiration, they will be preserved uh, until the Day of Judgment. Okay, and this is mentioned in the Quran. Inna nahnu nazalna dhikr wa inna lahu hafidun. We have revealed the Quran, and we're going to preserve it. And if you look at it, the Quran has been preserved in a very unique way. It is the most recited book. It is the most memorized book. There is no other book on the surface of this earth which is preserved to this level. Hundreds and thousands of people have actually memorized the Quran, and hundreds and thousands of people that read the Quran every day. Literally, they have memorized it from beginning to end. And it has been since the time of Prophet Muhammad, for 1400 years, there has never been a time, a week, a day, that this world was without a person, with, with, without the Qur'an in his heart. There was always people who had memorized the entire Qur'an. So this is one of, and it will be like this till the day of the week. This is one of the prophecies that I mentioned the Qur'an. There's also a little bit more, but inshallah, I'll leave that to the question and answer session, because time is running out. But there's a lot more. This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. But again, this can go on for a few hours, so I'll just stop here. And then if you have any questions, I'll try to um, answer them later on. Alright, so, so um, I'm going to pass out, uh, I have questions and I'm going um, to start reading them. Um, first off, I'm going to start with the ones you guys just handed me, and then we're going to continue with the ones that we got uh, at our previous meeting. So, um, okay, so um, we'll start with the older ones first, and then uh, we'll, we'll definitely finish these today. Okay, um, um, the first question is, uh, can you briefly explain the teachings of Islam? Okay, so very quickly, the teachings of Islam... First and foremost, we have to understand there is this misconception that Islam is a new religion and it came in, uh, into existence with the coming of Prophet Muhammad upon him some 1400 years ago. Actually, Islam was there since time immemorial, since man first stepped foot on this earth. Uh, Prophet Adam, he was actually Muslim. All of the prophets, both of Jesus, all of them were Muslims. So Islam was there uh, since the beginning. Islam means a state of submission where you submit unto the will of God. So it's not something that came new. So this is the first point. Second thing is that basically the teaching of Islam is no different than the teachings of Moses and Jesus. Just like in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, once a person came to Jesus and he said, Oh, uh, oh, um, oh master, oh, oh teacher, oh good teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the Old Testament? And he said to him, the greatest commandment of the Old Testament is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, so worship Him with all your heart, with all your uh, soul, and with all your mind. And the second commandment is, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And the rest of the commandments, they hold on to these two commandments. And this is also the teaching of Islam. You fulfill the rights of God. Believe in God and worship Him alone. And the second is, that you be good to your fellow human being, and then especially your neighbor. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, مَا زَالَ جِبْرِيلِ يُسُنِّ بِالْجَاءِ حَقَّ غَرَمْتُ أَنَّهُ سَيْوَرِتُ The angel gave you, kept on telling me the rights of my neighbor, and I thought eventually he might become my inheritor as well. So basically the teaching of Islam is, that you fulfill the rights of God, believe in God, worship Him, and believe in His oneness, and the second thing is, uh, be good to your fellow human beings, regardless of their race, gender, ethnicity, or religion. Um, second question, what is the difference between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism? Okay, now it depends on how you understand uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. If by Christianity and Judaism you mean the actual teachings of Jesus and Moses and Prophet Muhammad, then, and you'll be surprised to hear this, many people think that they're very similar. They're not just similar, they're the exact same thing. Okay, the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, of Jesus and Moses are the exact same thing. In fact, a person cannot be a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. A person cannot be a Muslim if he does not believe in Prophet Moses. If he does not believe in Mary, we have to believe in all of it. And this is mentioned clearly in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, شَرَعَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا وَصَّعَ بِهِ نُوحًا وَالَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا لَيْهِ We have legislated for you the same way of life, the same religion which we had legislated upon the previous prophets, namely Prophet Noah, Abraham, and Moses, and Jesus. So the religion is the exact same thing. There is no difference between the two. Yes, later on people in Judaism, in Islam, as well in Christianity, then people had different interpretations. And that is because people don't adhere to the actual teaching of the uh, scripture, and therefore you have different interpretation. But if you were to go with the actual scripture, then the teachings of all of the prophets is the exact same thing, there's no difference. Uh, third question is, uh, do Muslims believe in the Holy Spirit? Okay, um, this may be a little bit surprising for the Muslims. 
But yes, as Muslims, we do believe in the Holy Spirit, and that is Angel Gabriel. In the Quran, it is referred to as Ar-Ruh Al-Qudus. وَنَّزَّلَهُ رُوحُ الْقُدُسِ مِنْ رَبِّكَ بِالْحَقِّ The only difference is that we don't believe it is God. Like God is only one. But we believe, for example, in the parts of the Trinity. We believe, for example, in Jesus. We believe in the angel Gabriel, the Holy Spirit, and we believe in God. But the only difference is we believe God is only one, and angel Gabriel and Jesus, peace be upon him, he is a creation of God. God has created them. But God is only one. And this is the first commandment of the Old Testament, the, the first Ten Commandments, that thou should not have any other gods before me. But I, your God, am a jealous God. You should not have any greater image, either in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. So we believe in only one God, and this is the teaching of Jesus, as well as Moses, and also the teaching of Islam. So yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, except that we don't consider it to be God. We just believe that he was sent to give inspiration to the messengers of God. Um, is wearing necklaces, bracelets, or rings haram? Uh, no, for uh, females, no, it's not haram, it is permitted. Uh, however, in Islam, there are some restrictions that a woman, obviously, she's allowed to like beautify herself and everything. What's supposed to be done is done like in the house, and also to be done in, uh, in you know, for her husband, not to you know display her beauty too much outside. So yeah, there's some restrictions on that, but uh, uh, it is not haram for men. However, uh, like to wear gold, it is not allowed. Gold and uh, silk for men, this is not allowed. Gold and silk, and then some of the scholars, by way of analogy. Uh, rings, uh, when it comes to rings, it is allowed, okay? A silver ring is allowed, okay? But gold is not allowed no. for men. But for uh, ladies, sisters, it is allowed for them to uh, wear anything. How come it's not allowed for gold? For men? Yeah. It's just the restriction, you know, it's just whatever rules there are, we just follow them. Uh, one of the reasons because, I mean, this is just the wisdom behind it, it's just secondary reasons. The main reason is because if anything is mentioned in the Quran, or the Prophet Muhammad if he said it, and it is inspiration from God, and we just adhere to it. And this is basically what a Muslim is. He just completely submits to the will of God. Whatever God commands him, he obeys it totally. Now, there is some reasons, secondary reasons, that the reason why it is not allowed is because men are not supposed to imitate women, women are not supposed